All power to the people, comrades. All power to the people. Hey, all How power you doing? to the people. What's up, Jeff? I'm good. I'm good. How y'all doing? Good. All right. Chilling. Just had a heated political debate with my uh, dad, or stepdad. Oh, no. Nice. Those are always fun. Something that okay. happened. <laughs> was me arguing with my, with my dad. <laughs> those, those conversations are always always fun, <laughs> to say the least. It pretty much sums up to him greed is human nature. <laughs> Wait, what was that? And uh, he, it, it pretty much sums up to him believing that greed is human nature and that he, he's better. America will never be socialist, and in a way, he's kind of right. But I'm kind of like, you know, obviously, I'm on the side of America. So, yeah. <laughs> oh man, but it was still a, a good talk, even though he talked over me most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Right, bro. You see uh, radicalization in the future anytime soon? I don't know. He was he's telling me the uh, the importance of voting, so that's how it started. Ah. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. All right, um, comrades. Um, uh, you said that we can go ahead and start the meet. If um if four people are here, is that okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. Good with me. All righty. Um. So, uh, this is the first section of MLM MLM intensives. Uh, this came about because Comrade Rashid uh, contacted me uh, and requested that I uh, went through the Marxism, Leninism, Maoism basic course with, uh, with advanced cadres of the RIBP, excuse me, RIBPP. So I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be uh, helping along with this. Um, this is one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite uh, books and I recommend it to everybody that wants to get a basic understanding, not just of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, but of, um, but of the history of the proletarian revolutionary movement uh, throughout the entire world. So what is Marxism, Leninism, Maoism? Uh, it is the revolutionary ideology and practice of the 21st century, or we can call Marxism, Leninism, the revolutionary ideology and practice of the 20th century, we can expand that and develop that to say that Marxism, Leninism, Maoism is the revolutionary ideology and practice of the century in which we currently live. Why? Because it is currently being applied in several countries to guide revolution and topple the mountains that Mao described of semi-feudalism slash semi-colonialism and bureaucrat capitalism, also known as sellout capitalism, and fascism. We who live in the imperial core, going against the third worldists who claim that there is no hope for revolution in this country or any other imperial metropole, and when I say imperial metropole, I'm saying center of capitalism and imperialism. These are the countries of the United States, uh, Canada, the EU countries, Australia, Japan, um, and uh, China. Because when we talk about the Marxist, Leninist, Maoist position on imperialism, we also have to expand it to include the development of social imperialism. And it is the Marxist, Leninist, Maoist position that China is currently a social imperialist country. We realize that we must take up our posts for the revolution that will help lift these mountains off the backs of our class siblings across the world. So we're not just here to cheerlead about, 
oh, look at what they're doing in the Philippines. Look at what they're doing in India. Look at what they're doing in Turkey, Peru, all these places. <clears throat> that is not productive if that's all we do. International solidarity is important, but the highest form of international solidarity is to make revolution in the United States. But to make revolution in the United States requires that we master the basic principles of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, because as Lenin said, there can be no revolutionary movement without revolutionary theory. What he meant when he said without the right theoretical tools to help us steer clear of the traps of dogmatism, eclecticism, and revisionism of all types, along with the right opportunism, we will fail like countless uh, would-be revolutionaries before us. And with climate change rapidly becoming ever more of an existential crisis and fascism deepening itself in the United States, we simply have no time to lose. So um, for this first week, the assigned reading was uh, chapters one through five of the basic course. I really like these chapters because they're relatively short. Otherwise, I wouldn't have assigned several of them for each week. So the foundational history of Marxism. Um, these chapters discuss where did Marxism come from? Uh, did it spring out of Marx's head? No. Because we know as communists that everything is rooted and based in something. So when we talk about where did Marxism come from, we're talking about the social economic conditions that led to its development. And since Maoism is the ideology of the proletariat, what do you have to have uh, before you can develop an ideology of the proletariat? You have to have a proletariat, right? So what is the proletariat? A lot of people misunderstand this term. Proletariat is defined by Marx as the class which has nothing to sell but its labor power. And the proletariat developed in Europe because the Industrial Revolution developed first in Europe. If the Industrial Revolution had developed in West Africa or in South America or in Japan or in China, then Marxism would have developed in these places. Of course, it wouldn't have been called Marxism. It would have been called something else. But the basic principles would have remained the same. So the introduction, um, it starts out by providing us with an injunction against dogma. Now, how do we define dogma? Basically, oh, you have to know every single work by Marx or everything that Marx said is applicable to today. No. And in many cases, people raise this as a boogeyman, like, oh, you're going to make revolution because you believe that every word that Marx said is, is, uh, is true and relevant today. Of course not. Because the material conditions have changed. We don't have massive factories in most places anymore. Those have all been outsourced and shuttered. And Marx also uh, said quite a few racist things. He never really developed a full grasp of the national slash racial slash ethnic contradictions in the United States. And in many cases, he said outright racist things. I believe he called Mexicans lazy at one point. And uh, he called... Um, another another European socialist called uh, Ferdinand LaSalle, uh, the N-word. He called him a nigger. So uh, Marx was very much a product of his time. But at the same time, we also we also adhere to the um, to the developments made by Watson and Crick in the field of genetics. And we also recognize that Watson was uh, was a racist. And we uh, adhere to the theories of, um, of evolution that were developed by Darwin, theories of physics that were developed by Isaac Newton, but we don't worship these individuals. That's what a lot of anti-communists on the left fail to understand. So in order to mold our practice, because a lot of people just go out and they do practice, and they don't study any theory behind it, and then they get burnt out, and they get upset when their uh, when their practice doesn't advance the revolutionary product project. As communists, every bit of work that we do, all of our social investigation and class analysis, all of our attendance at protests, everything that we write, has to be with the revolution at the forefront 
of our minds. If revolution is not at the forefront of our minds, we're just spinning our wheels. We might as well go work for a nonprofit. So, and I say this because, like, I see a lot of people, uh, they set up a table on a corner somewhere and they hand out groceries to people. That's fine. It's very good charity work. But how exactly does this so-called mutual aid advance the cause of the revolution? How does this organize the people around opposing and working to overthrow the abominable congregation in which we are forced to live? So when we begin our study, what is communism? If you don't know what communism is, you have no business calling yourself a communist. Why would you go around calling yourself something that you don't know uh, what it is? Um, chapter two starts out, second paragraph, communism is the doctrine of the prerequisites for the emancipation of the proletariat. This is the essence of our communist ideology. It's not just uh, emancipation from low wages or abominable conditions in the factories. That's part and parcel of capitalism. There is no clean, healthy, secure capitalism or any capitalism in which all of the wealth is shared. Why? Because if you sit on a whole bunch of money, if you got your bag, you're going to get your bag up for moral reasons. I talk to any honest capitalist. They're, they're like, they will tell you, yeah, I exploit people because I like being rich. I want to be rich, to be rich. The bourgeoisie, in many cases, is far more class conscious than, uh, than certain members of the certain strata of the working class, particularly the white working class. Um, so communism is a doctrine of the prerequisites for the emancipation of the proletariat. We're talking about the political power. You cannot emancipate yourself if you don't have no power, if you cannot develop power. Where does political power come from? The barrel of a gun. Pretty sure everybody knows this quote. So the doctrine of the prerequisites for the emancipation of the proletariat. The essence of communist ideology, quoting from the uh, book here, the essence of communist ideology is to provide the theory regarding what is needed to achieve the ultimate freedom of the working class, the proletariat. What is our freedom? Communism. What do we have to pass through to get to communism? Socialism. We can't just hop from capitalism to communism. Some anarchists have tried it. Some anarchists have failed. What is Marxism? Stalin said, Marxism is the science of the laws governing the development of nature and society, the science of the revolution of the oppressed and exploited masses, the science of the victory of socialism in all countries, the science of building a communist society. So if we are serious about building a communist society, it is essential that we be Marxists. It's a science. It's an all-encompassing science. It's a science regarding revolution, and it cannot be used by the rich. Like I see a lot of so-called uh, academics from the ruling class playing and toying with Marx's ideology. You can't do that because it's not for you. That's like me playing and toying with white supremacist ideology. We can't do that. I'm a black man. These, this ideology is for maintaining the continued supremacy of white people over my over my uh, my people. So why would I try to pick that up and apply it to us? Come on. So where did Marxism come from? It was developed more than 150 years ago. It was worked out by Marx and Engels. A lot of people forget Engels, but Engels was the tag team here. For one, Engels, uh, what did he do for a living? He owned a factory. So you have a literal bourgeois that helped develop the ideology of the proletariat, unity of opposites, so to speak. Um, what are the principal parts of Marxism? About the philosophy of dialectical materialism and the discovery of the materialist con conception of history or historical materialism. You have Marx's political economy, which discovered the laws of motion of capitalism and its contradictions and the doctrine of surplus value which uncovered the source of exploitation and a theory of scientific socialism based on the doctrine of the class struggle and the outlining of the principles governing the tactics of the class struggle of the proletariat. Now, when we get to talking about revisionism, revisionism basically believes that none of this 
is necessary. You could just go and you could go in parliament or we don't have a parliament in the United States. You could build socialism peacefully through com um, through Congress or through getting elected to some bullshit local office or through, I don't know, community gardening. I've had some people say that community gardening is inherently revolutionary. Is it a good thing to do? Yes. Is it inherently revolutionary? No. Churches have community gardens. So that's Marxism. That's the OG. What is Leninism? Leninism is essentially Marxism that is developed through praxis, through practice, because it was Lenin, the revolution that Lenin led, that was Marxism applied to the conditions of society for the very first time. The ideology of the Bolsheviks was Marxism. So, personally, I believe the main contribution that Lenin left us was, well, there were two. The theory of imperialism and the theory of the vanguard party. So, um, going back to the book, it says, Leninism, while de defending and developing Marxism, made the following significant contributions. The discovery of the laws of motion of capitalism under imperialism, under moribund capitalism, or capitalism that has outlived, because capitalism at one time was progressive, because it was the guiding force, the bourgeoisie, the class for which capitalism works, the ruling class under capitalism, overthrew um, overthrew feudalism. France, America, those revolutions, those were bourgeois capitalist revolutions. He set up bourgeois capitalist countries. The United States is distinguished in history because it was the first thoroughly bourgeois society. All of our government institutions, from Congress, from the Supreme Court, from the White House, all the way down to your local sheriff, are bourgeois institutions because going back to history, when dudes wore wigs and uh, stockings, the guys that wore the wigs and stockings, those were proto-capitalists. These were your merchants. These were your slave owners. These were your shippers. Wasn't nobody broke. Wasn't nobody black. Wasn't no woman write the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. These documents are not for us. They are not for our class. They are not for our nation. These were developed first and foremost, entirely for the benefit of the rich white capitalists whose contradictions with Great Britain had reached such an extent that they went to war and successfully won their independence with the help of France. So whenever you hear somebody talking about reforming American institutions, keep in mind Marxism teaches us that you are never, ever, 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 ever going to reform these insidious institutions that are developed first and foremost for the benefit of the rich. They're not going to let you. They hold all the cards. So what is it going to take? Armed struggle. That's a card that we can hold. Maoism is an extension and development of Marxism-Leninism applicable to the present era. It was developed by Mao during the course of the Chinese Revolution. What are Maoism's contributions? The theory of contradictions, the development of the theory of knowledge in the formulation of the mass line, meaning from the masses to the masses, the theory of new democracy, the formulation of the path of revolution for colonies and semi-colonies, and the formulation regarding the three instruments of the revolution, the Communist Party, the People's Army, and the United Front, the theory of protracted people's development of the principles of proletarian warfare, the development of the organizational principles of the proletarian party through the understanding of two-line struggle, Rectification campaigns and criticism, self criticism, the development of the political economy of socialism on the basis of the Soviet and Chinese experience, and the dialectical understanding of the process of socialist construction as the correct handling of contradictions in the process of transition to socialism. And finally, and the Indians say this is most importantly, the theory and practice of continuing revolution under the dictatorship of the proletariat to consolidate socialism, combat modern revisionism and prevent the restoration of capitalism and its concrete expression, the concrete expression of, of um, the necessity and the theory and practice of continuing the revolution under the DOTP is in the great proletarian cultural revolution. 
And this part ends with saying, Marxism, Leninism, and Maoism are thus not separate ideologies, but represent the constant growth and advancement of one and the same ideology. Okay? Consider it like a whiteboard. Okay? You're doing a math problem. Okay? You make a mistake on a math problem. For example, the Paris Commune, it failed. You make a mistake, but you leave that mistake that you made up on the board to teach um, to teach students to make to avoid making these same mistakes. So you don't just smack a kid on the wrist with a ruler. Of course, that's illegal nowadays. But you don't just smack somebody on the wrist with a ruler because they write two plus two equals five. You explain to them. You leave that mistake up on the board, and you explain to them. No, two plus two equals four, because the qualities of these two numbers, when they're put together, make four, not five. So that's essentially what Marxism is. Marxism, Leninism, Maoism is not just a checklist. Okay, it's not just something. Oh, if you check this, 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 if you check this you're one hundred percent Maoist. No. There's no such thing as a 100% Maoist. We all have some types of deviations and stuff in our thinking. Mao said that the Chinese Communist Party contained both 1% and 99% Maoist, never 100%. That's undialectical because everything is constantly in motion. You may be a revolutionary one day. You might be a reactionary tomorrow. Same thing. You might be a reactionary today. You might be a revolutionary tomorrow. It depends on where your objective and subjective conditions are. So do we have any questions so far? Can y'all hear me uh, all right? Not me. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Huh? All right. This is the one. No problems. So the socioeconomic conditions leading to the birth of Marxism. We've already partially gone over this. Okay? You had feudalism. Why? Because it had extended its usefulness. There was no more need for kings and queens and absolute monarchies in Europe. Um, and matter of fact, it wasn't just that there was no more need for this backward system, but it was actually inhibiting the development of the new system. Marx taught us that history is what? Class struggle, violent class struggle. So when your ideology, not ideology, your way of doing things reaches the end of its useful period, it's going to snap. You're going to have antagonistic contradictions. The old cannot reside uh, alongside the new. That's like saying, okay, uh, one part of the country, something just happened like what? I'm confused. Jay, can you hear me? All right. Uh, is everything technically good, like in terms of technology and stuff? The call just ended for Jay, and it says it's locked now. This is why I wanted to use Jitsi. <laughs> but anyways... Yeah. Um, Yeah, I never really like this. Right, I'm going to have him to call me. It, yeah, it locks automatically after 15 minutes. Huh, I did not know that. Um, yeah, she changed it to... Um, hold on. All right, well, let me uh, let me know when he calls you. I don't want to go forward. Uh, all right, you and Jay? All right, Jay's back. Can you all hear me? Jay, you got it? Yeah, now we hear you. Yeah. All right. I didn't want to leave you behind. But um, so Marxism was established over 150 years ago during the 1840s. It was established first in Europe because Europe was where all the stolen wealth of the New World, of India, of Africa, of South America, all of these places of Asia concentrated. So that was where we had your first bourgeoisie. And simultaneously, 
your burger first proletariat. The proletariat cannot exist without the bourgeoisie, and the bourgeoisie cannot exist without the proletariat. You can't be a bourgeois without exploiting people. You cannot be a proletarian without somebody exploiting you. So Marx and Engels were born and lived in some of the most economically advanced parts of Europe while they were developing the ideas of Marxism. They in France and uh, France, Germany, and the uh, UK. I want to say England, but the UK already existed at this time. Um, so they observed, participated in, and were influenced by all the major political events of that time. So we have to look at where Europe was at at this time that led to the development of Marxism. The most important factor was the Industrial Revolution, because without the Industrial Revolution, you have neither proletariat or bourgeoisie. Okay? And the foundation for the Industrial Revolution, the material foundation, was laid by old style colonialism, settler colonialism in uh, the West Indies and South and North America. If it wasn't for the furs, the cotton, the sugar, and never mind the gold and the silver that was taken uh, from Central and South America and North America uh, to help build up finance capital in Europe, um, there would have been no industrial revolution. You can't, have a, you can't have a textile factory without cotton. You can't have a rum distillery without sugar to make the rum. Um, you can't have a cigar factory without tobacco. So that's, um, without any of that, you wouldn't have had any industrial revolution. That's why we always say that there would be no capitalism without, uh, without slavery because it was slavery first of the indigenous people of these continents and of these islands and then of, uh, African people that, laid the foundations for this. Even if, even up to this very day, a lot of these insurance companies, a lot of these old, old, old companies that were around in the 1800s and 1700s, all their money, their starting capital came out of slavery. Most of these people started out as slave traders or dealers in slave products. So it transformed the capitalist class. Beforehand, it was just the middle class, these merchants and stuff. The modern industrial bourgeoisie, these millionaires, they came out of the Industrial Revolution. And alongside the industrial bourgeoisie came the class that made it so rich, the industrial working class or the proletariat. What is the proletarian class back then? It consisted of workers working together by the thousands in large factories. You come to the United States, early, mid-20th century. We used to have huge factories in Detroit, St. Louis. Uh, Newark, all of these huge industrial centers, uh, Pittsburgh, where your steel mills were, you had thousands of people working together. Nowadays, what do we have? We got only place where you have several hundred people working together is maybe a call center or something like that. Um, so conditions have changed. And going back, going back to uh, Huey Newton, Huey Newton predicted this in the early 70s. He said he um, saw the neoliberal trend, what was happening. He saw all these factories closing down and the old industrial proletariat being gutted. That's why the unemployment rates in all of these old industrial cities like Gary, Indiana are so high because they were uh, they closed all the factories. So the main thing about modern proletarians is that they possess nothing else except the labor power. Nothing but your labor power. You don't have a little hustle on the side in the form of a little small business or nothing like that. You have nothing but your labor power. So what was going on politically in Europe? You had the bourgeois democratic revolutions, the most important of which was what? The French Revolution. Across the ocean, you had the American Revolution. And in Napoleon, where the armies of the French bourgeoisie almost took over whole all of Europe. And they also went around abolishing feudalism. So you had the political struggle. This was a struggle between capitalism and feudalism. Just like now, the struggle is between capitalism and socialism. So 
historical materialism teaches us that history is not just a march from event to event to event to event divorced from class. History is ultimately class struggle. Every political move, every move period has the interests or the organization of some class or coalition of classes behind it. And once you realize that, you'll understand history and how it works. So any questions so far? So what was the history of the labor movement up until the development of Marxism? It was very scattered. You had the Luddites. Uh, they'd go around and they'd smash up machines and stuff like that. And going back even further, you had what they called the diggers or the leveler, levelers. Because in England, um, you had the feudal lords. They were doing what they called enclosures. Because back then, they used to have common land where you could go and you could grow a little vegetable patch. or you could um, you could let your cattle graze or whatever, and everybody had the ability to use it. So peasants liked the common land. Okay, they started to fence off this common land. It's like, okay, you can't just turn your cows out into the middle of this field anymore. This is private property. And uh, there was a struggle against that. Um, so that's why a lot of uh, peasants ended up landless and broke and didn't have anything. And the old way of life, like before the Industrial Revolution, most of these things that were essential, uh, a single off and stuff like that, these were made by small producers. Like you might have a workshop where 10 or 20 people work, but there were no factories where 2,000 people worked at the same time. No. Most of your cloth was made by uh, peasant women in a cottage in the countryside. That ended. You also started having these worker uprisings. You had uprisings in London, Manchester, France, Germany, all over the place. And these, as these things spread, um, when Marx and Engels came on the scene, they were able to study and, um, and look at these things and write about them. And they started pulling out common trends. So chapter three ends by saying that the proletariat coming into material existence also meant at the same time the birth of the ideas representing this new revolutionary class. Many ideas and theories claiming to represent working class interests thus came into being. Marxism, when it was first formulated in the 1840s, was only one among them. However, though many theories had emerged from the same economic conditions, Marxism alone provided the tools to properly understand these conditions and also to change them. Therefore, in the years to come, it was Marxism alone that would prove to be the true proletarian ideology. Why? Because it was the most comprehensive and it was rooted in reality. A lot of these other things that were rooted in, well, we want to go back to the past. No. Marx and Engels realized that there is no going back to the past. There is no utopian commune. There is no running off to the mountains or anything like that. So chapter four talks about the life of uh, both Marx and Engels. Um, they came from pretty well-off families. Um, Marx's family was from a long line of, uh, of rabbis. And uh, I believe Marx's, yeah, Marx's dad was a lawyer. And Engels' uh, dad was literally a bourgeois. Um, they were university students. Uh, Engels and Marx, they both drank a lot. And uh, Marx began writing about things that he uh, noticed. And he bounced around all over the place. And throughout his whole life, he was a really hard worker. Um, but he also loved a good time. He loved to drink like most Germans do. Um, and he became a radical journalist. Um, he started writing about and taking part in the radical movement, uh, that was sweeping Germany at the time. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the, because the 1848 Thank revolution. Thank you for using GTL. 
when somebody got kicked off again? No, that was Comrade Pitt leaving. Ah, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Is he coming back? I don't know. I won't know until he calls again. I don't think so, though. I think he right. just had a little bit more time. All right. Um. Anyways, um. So Marx, uh, started writing for newspapers, and he used it as a, as a tool, to fight for these radical democratic rights because Germany was divided. Germany wasn't unified until eighteen seventy. 1871 by uh, Otto von Bismarck. Um, before then, it was a it was a bunch of um, a bunch of provinces, uh, each ruled by their own little king or queen or duke or duchess or all of these little uh, little groups. They all spoke German, but it was never politically unified until 1871, I believe. Um. So. Yeah, that's essentially what it was. He was bouncing around, uh, moving from place to place. He eventually got exiled from his own country, ended up in France. Um, and he started working with the socialist and communist groups there. And he started actually taking part in these meetings and talking to these people. And that helped him hash ideology while also um, criticizing these uh, some of the more uh, backwards socialist trends. Um, and there, he continued to study. Where was Engels born? Engels was born in uh, in Germany, well, Prussia. And his dad was rich, had a lot of money. Matter of fact, he funded both uh, both Marx and himself. Uh, ideological work and uh, travels and stuff like that. So his dad sent him away and he continued studying and he became a conferencer while also uh, learning quite a few languages. Um, and he, like Marx, became attracted to the radical democratic ideas that was developing uh, all across Europe. Then he started studying Hegel. That's where he, um, that's where both he and Marx got um, their political, not political, philosophical underpinnings from, along with a fellow named Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, and why did Engels become a communist? Because he moved to England and he developed links with uh, workers in England and he uh, started observing and going to meetings of the Chartist movement. Manchester was important because it was the center of the industrial textile industry. Of course, this was still made by African slaves, but um, but Manchester was the place to be if you wanted to study the working class and its living conditions. He would actually go to working class areas to learn about how people lived. He also met his wife there. Um, so that's Marx and Engels. Where they came from. So what were the three sources of Marxism? First one was German classical philosophy. The second one was um, English political economy. And the third one was the various French socialist theories. So early Marxism, OG Marxism, so to speak, Marxism, Marxism, came from where? Came from these three sources, English political economy, German philosophy, and French socialist theories. These were the sources. And there are critiques of all of these trends and through these critiques while taking what was correct from these things, for example, the English political economists, people like Ed David Ricardo, these were still bourgeois, okay? These were bourgeois people. They weren't going to be like workers of the world unite and overthrow us. But at the same time, their, um, their theories as bourgeois 
um, even though they serve the interests of their own class, they also laid the foundation for the principles of Marxist political economy as we know it today. For example, Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, and he argued, this was an anti-feudal argument, that capitalism, if we were allowed to grow, would lead to the fullest development of humanity. Of course, we now know that it led to climate disaster and the impending doom of our species if we do not implement communism as soon as possible. Um, and Ricardo fought against, well, fought against with his pen, the landlords, on behalf of the bourgeoisie. So Marx and Engels were brilliant because they were able to take all of these theories which served various classes or theories that supposedly served the working class, but in reality didn't because they weren't scientific and developed enough um, and develop a comprehensive system out of it. That's why Marxism is inherently the enemy of dogmatism, because Marx and Engels themselves were not dogmatists. They read and they studied everything they can get their hands on to help develop the theory of the working class. If it was bad, they critiqued it, and they also published their critiques. If it was good, they incorporated it and united with it and implemented it into the theory of the working class that we now know as Marxism. So that's the end of the um, lecture part. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Uh, not All, for right. Me. <laughs> All right. So discussion questions on the foundational history of Marxism. Uh, what can we say are the contributions of the Marxist, Leninist, and Maoist eras in our history. How do they come together to make a comprehensive ideology for revolution and party building in the American context? What are the most important discoveries and contributions of each of these uh, eras of our history? So the Marxist era, that was the mid-late 1800s. The Leninist era, that was the 20th century, up until the Chinese Revolution. And we could say that the proto-Maoist to the Maoist era is from 1949, which is the victory of the Chinese Revolution up till now. So how did all of this come together? How can we use this stuff in the United States, essentially? Uh, so the question is, how can we use this in the United States? Yeah. First of all, what are the contributions of these three eras in our history? And then secondly, how do they come together to make a comprehensive ideology for revolution and party building in the American context? Or we can flip the question. What are the most important discoveries and contributions of each of these eras in our history? And how can we apply them to the U.S.? I guess for Marxism, it was uh, like a materialist uh, base for dialectics and for uh, looking at history and the link of class struggle um, as the movers of history. And then with Leninism, it would be like looking at capitalism from the imperialist uh, outlook and uh, the importance of the Vanguard party. And uh, for Maoism, for Maoists, it would be like uh, what the theory of knowledge is, uh, the mass line, um, Theory of contradictions, new democracy. Uh, oh, and the, the importance of continuing revolution, even past uh, gaining power and against modern revisionism. I'm missing, I feel like I'm missing right. something from the Maoist era. You um, got the main, you got the main, you got the main most important one, though. The main one um, is the the continuance of the of the um, the continuance of the class struggle 
during socialism. I don't even venture so far to say that the difference between Maoism and revisionism is that revisionists don't believe that class struggle continues under socialism. They believe that any social democratic government, any government with the red flag uh, can call itself socialist. But they don't realize that these countries have been uh, captured by the bourgeoisie and the so-called cop, the so-called communist party has a bourgeois line in command. And like Mao said about Deng Xiaoping, this individual, this individual, does not know the difference between communism and imperialism. That's what a revisionist is. So you got that right, Comrade Garland. The most important thing is the continued class struggle under socialism. And uh, I think isn't that what wasn't that one of like one of Stalin's biggest weaknesses too? Kind of like kind of just thought it ended there. Yeah, Stalin. Um, the 1936 um, Constitution of the Soviet Union actually said that there were no more classes in the USSR. Uh, Shu asks, are we still on? So, yeah, the um, and we'll get into more of the critique on Stalin in, in, in a few weeks. But, um, yeah, and... Um, that was Stalin's main error, in my opinion, of course, killing killing a bunch of people was also up there. But uh, uh, <laughs> declaring class struggle over meant that, uh, meant that, okay, so the new bourgeoisie, like keep in mind, all of these new bourgeois, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, they came up under Stalin, right? Um, they came up under socialism. And then after Stalin died, now keep in mind, they kissed his ass right up until the day that man died. And then afterwards, they undid all of the development work uh, of socialism in the Soviet Union, the very first socialist country. So, yeah, they rotted two countries, the Soviet Union and China, because they did not continue the class struggle, the proletariat under, uh, under socialism. China had the Cultural Revolution, but it ended up being ended by a coup. And we'll talk about that at the end of these intensives. But you got that right. Now, to make a comprehensive ideology for revolution and party building in the American context, we're beneficiaries, okay? We're privileged because we have access to this entire treasury of, um, of knowledge developed through failure. Like, millions of people have died to realize communism. And through these millions of deaths, we have this ideology that has been given to us and is still developing. There are still people's wars going on in India, the Philippines, Turkey. And also Nepal, I believe, is about to pop back off as well. I don't know that much about what's going on in Peru. But um, we still have three to four people's wars. And each time that the proletariat picks arms throughout history, that's advancing our ideology, that's advancing the class. Uh, anything else uh, around question one? I guess what we're still right. on, how, involve, how does it relate to, how does it help us in the United States, right? Yeah. I mean, like the main I guess thing you you'll hear is a Mao. Go ahead. The main thing you'll hear is a Maoist from revisionists and from the masses is that, oh yeah, that's over there. Like yeah, it works for China, but how is this going to work for us? That's the main thing you'll hear. Like, say you're at a park during a social investigation and class analysis, and somebody sees the red book in your pocket or something like that. And uh, they came up through the 60s. They know what it is. And they just say, oh, man, that shit ain't going to work here. We got to vote. Stuff like that. Like, how do you answer them? How is this relevant to revolution and party building in the American context or anywhere in the global north? I would I would tell them that, um, that even though these aren't exact uh, copy and paste situations, there are still a lot of similarities 
that we in the Americas, uh, in the United States of America, uh, can pull information from, especially in the, especially in that kind of like semi-feudal kind of colonialist aspect. I feel like that a lot of that is replic, and especially when I was when I would read uh, Miles' writings from his selected works, I could see similarities in between what he was writing and to what we're experiencing now. So, I mean, in that aspect of like the Mao, Mao book question, that's how I would answer that. Yeah, and part of the reason that the OG Panthers dug Mao so much, they loved Mao, was because here's another fellow, okay, China had been sliced up in the many, many different pieces by the imperialists, both Japanese and Western. And here he is, he's not like, a, he's not overbearing, uh, saying that, oh, you, there's this one, one way to make revolution and everybody else is bad. No. He was like, every country, every people has to make their own revolution. That's another reason why, uh, why uh, the Cubans were so popular. Um, because they provided an example. And also, they, they really, really loved the armed struggle bit. Because um, new African urban culture is what heavily uh heavily focused around action around practice when the OG Panthers when they got up and they put that they uh put a dude with a shotgun on the corner and they put a stop sign up so that cars wouldn't barrel through an intersection uh mowing down little kids people related to that more than if they just stood on the corner reading from quotations from Chairman Mao um so People really, really loved Mao's uh, orientation towards practice. He literally wrote a piece called On Practice. So to make it a comp to make Marxism, Leninism, Maoism relevant enough that it is actually picked up as the revolutionary guide of the new African people and other press nationalities here, along with um working class white people, along with all who are exploited and oppressed by this system, they have to be able to relate to what we're telling them. Does that make sense? Who am I rambling? Makes sense. I don't want to be the only one responding. Right. Does, does it make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Uh, Sojourner, you can respond as well. If I'm rambling, y'all can tell me to shut up, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, this can't just be a conversation between me and Comrade Garland. Um, he is entirely correct. Um, so two, what laid the foundation for the rise of the bourgeoisie and for the proletariat? Like what, why was capitalism able to supersede feudalism? Industrial Revolution, when all the factories and stuff started coming in. Right. And not just that, but even before the Industrial Revolution, you had to have the raw materials for that stuff, right? Because you can't grow no mm -hmm. cotton in England and Germany and France. They had to, they <laughs> had to get us first. They had to get us first because they couldn't, they couldn't make no cotton. They couldn't make no cotton cloth in Manchester with no cotton. So, mm -hmm. so you had the primitive accumulation of... Uh, of black people, they tried to enslave the in, um, the indigenous people, but um, for some reason, I don't I don't know why, but white folks did not understand that you cannot enslave somebody on their own land because they will run because they know the land far better than you do because they've lived there for thousands of years. But I digress. Um, so they had to transport us over from Africa, and that's what laid the foundations for capitalism. So there would be no capitalism. There would have been no industrial revolution without us. All of this, all of these skyscrapers, stuff like that, the Queen of England's crown and scepter, Buckingham Palace, the White House, none of that would exist without the primitive accumulation off the backs of black people on land stolen from our indigenous brothers and sisters. So that is what laid the foundation for the rise of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat the Industrial Revolution, and the enslavement and theft of land and people. 
So what class was overthrown as a result of the Industrial Revolution development process? The feudal class? Yeah, the feudal class, the aristocrats. Like, y'all don't know, like, dukes, marquises, uh, counts, viscounts, uh, kings, queens. Like, they actually used to go to war with each other. Like, the king used to put on his... He used to take off his crown and he used to put on his armor and shit and he'd ride out in front of the head of an army. Like kings used to die in yeah. battle. Now all they do is grow. Now all they do is get old. But like, <laughs> yeah, that used to be. Those were the people that had the real the real clout. Knights and shit. Nowadays a knight mm -hmm. is just somebody that's, I don't know, given to such or such an amount to charity. But back then, knights actually used to have to ride out and kill people. But um, so yeah, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, you had these aristocrats that would actually, that actually had power, but they were unseated by the bourgeoisie because they had become a backwards class. They had become a break on development. Nobody needed them anymore. They were not they were conducive to the continued development of humanity. Oh, hello, Shu. How kind of you to join us. It's my meeting. Why would I not? <laughs> All power to the people. We're on a discussion. All power to the people. We're on discussion question. Okay. All power to the people. We're on discussion question number two, comrade. All power to the people. So, yeah, we were just talking about how the how the old feudal ruling class, kings, queens, dukes, all that shit, were overthrown by the bourgeoisie because the bourgeoisie's place in history had come because the old feudal class had become a break on the continued development of societies in Europe. So that's what, that's what led to the rise of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And we also discussed how Slavery and uh, land theft and genocide laid the material foundations for the Industrial Revolution. So any more discussion on that point? All right. Uh, three. How could Marxism have arisen only in a capitalist society divided be between bourgeoisie and the proletariat why did it not arise in say west africa or china what was the major factor that gave birth to marxism during this period um i would say because the productive forces were quote unquote more developed in england and germany and france Yeah, the socioeconomic changes of the time provided the basis for the emergence of the true proletarian ideology, quote Nia, the source here. So yeah, because Europe was where all of these factors were in motion. Uh, Europe was in the process of stealing and concentrating all of the world's wealth, where? In Europe. So alongside of huge wealth, you also had grinding, soul-crushing poverty. Um, so that's why Marxism can only arise in a capitalist society divided between bourgeoisie and proletariat because this was the most advanced system at the time because China and West Africa, these were still, they hadn't even, they had advanced to capitalism yet. They still were trapped in, a, in the feudal stage in most places. Um, so what was the principal factor that gave birth to Marxism during this period? The sharpening class struggle and um, the revolts that were being waged by the proletariat in Europe. All right, question four. How did Marx develop throughout his life, and how did his experiences in the period in which he lived 
help push him towards laying the foundations for Marxism? Like, what was it about this dude's life that pushed him towards developing Marxism? Same thing, same question for Engels. Like, why was Marx, I'm not going to even call him special, but why was Marx um, perfectly situated to help develop this ideology? Uh, I guess he, he had uh, ample schooling. He had uh, he was in a place where he was able to learn as much as he wanted to. Um, yeah, he had a, he had an interest in that type of stuff too, and so combine that with time, you know, he was able to, and he was observant, obviously. So yeah, and he traveled a lot. Both of them traveled a lot. He lived in a um... He lived in England, France, and Germany. So he traveled a lot. And like you said, he was very observant and he had uh, time to study. That's also why a lot of the revolutionary leaders come from the intellectual class or come from the so-called upper classes. Um, Because they had the time, like Marx spent most of his later life in the British uh, library. The dude was a nerd. He spent most of his time in the British library reading books or passed out on his couch. But like workers could not afford to do that. They had to go, they couldn't afford to spend their entire life in the library somewhere. What do workers have to do? Gotta work. Work. When that factory whistle blows, what you gotta do? Marx didn't have a factory whistle to listen to. He could get up when he wanted, he could say he wanted. Workers couldn't do that. They had to go to work. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to pay for their uh, little dinky one-room flat. Make sense? Mm-hmm. Hey, y'all, I'm here. I'm on mute because I'm still doing something. And really quickly, okay. Rush attempted to, tr- to uh, call in, but the uh, phone systems are doing the usual. But I just want to let you all know I'm here um, watching and listening. No, I'm here, though. All right. I may comment in the chat if I can. So. Okay. I don't know if you all can see the chat, but I'm putting you back on mute. Let me see. Yeah, I can see the chat. There we go. All right. So what were the three sources of Marxism and how did they come together to produce what we now know as classical or old school Marxism from the 1800s? Uh, Would that be like uh, like a dialectical materialist lens, kind of like uh, the socialist ideological uh, ideology from the French, and like the industrial kind of progressiveness of England. Do I have that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's English political economy, German progressive philosophy, and French, French socialism. Uh, socialism. And they came together to produce what we now know as classical Marxism. How? What did Marx and Engels do to each one of these ideologies, like, or trends of thought? Like, did they just be like, okay, we got to take everything that Adam Smith said and say it's right, or we're going to take everything Hegel said and say it's right? They refined them. They took the parts that actually made sense um, and discarded the things that didn't. Right. Yeah, Um, that's how we have to do with any... No, I'm not even supposed to be here. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be on mute. I'm, I'm, I'm still working, you all. But I can't stay on mute. (laughs) I'm really going back on mute now. Okay. (laughs) 
Yeah. All right. Um, but yeah, uh, Kyle Wright, she was right. What they did was they took the good and they threw out the bad. Uh, and that's what every revolutionary theoretician or thinker has done that has been successful. Of course, you have some people that follow along behind the bad because they're stubborn or maybe, I don't know. People do a lot of things that they're not supposed to do. But um, yeah, every successful revolutionary theoretician, every successful revolutionary is defined mainly by their ability to adapt and by their ability to take the good from previous lessons and current lessons and apply it to their concrete situation all the way through to victory. Um, that's all for the discussion questions. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, just that I really want to appreciate Comrade Chris and you uh, leading this discussion. Um, I've been enjoying the, uh, you know, I got, I got the plan, the lesson plan a little bit early. Um, and I just think we have a really good opportunity here um, with this, you know, this basic course. I appreciate Comrade Chris's time in developing the questions. And I'm looking forward to being able to participate more fully um at our next meeting and hopefully Rashid can be here too because i think this is um it just lays the, the foundation for just like a really bomb ass conversation and it's just sharpening us you know with the basics yeah yeah well, i greatly appreciate everybody being here tonight i have to do another one of these at 8 30 central standard time for ftp sdl we're reading heavy radicals um but um, yeah, for next week, uh, it is Dialectical Historical Materialism and Scientific Socialism. The reading is chapters six and seven of the basic course. Uh, if you have any questions, hit me up on Signal. Uh, have a Let good me evening. ask you really quickly, comrade. Um, should we already have the questions? Like, um, like we, we should obviously read the material, but should we already have our questions answered maybe or... Is that just something we're going to come into the into the conversation that's just kind of free flow? Yeah, the purpose of like it's I, I when I when I was uh, thinking and making these making these questions up, I didn't want it to be too much like a you know like a college lecture lecture where okay. oh you got the wrong answer so you gotta go no I want I want it to be like open discussion between all comrades so that we get together we can develop our um, understanding. Okay. Okay. Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, comrades Jerner, right, comrade Garth, comrade, comrade Chi, I really appreciate you. All right. Thank you, comrade. Really appreciate y'all. Good night. No problem. All, right, all power to the people. All power, all power to the people. All power to the people.